y'all. This is the Journey Toll Podcast, and I'm your host, Sean Zanotti. I believe life is about the journey, not the destination, to find the journey in every step of the road. The highs and lows, the twists and turns, the ups and downs, it's in that. It's in those moments that makes life so beautiful. Our guest today has a journey of his own. Sean Drawn is a retired NFL back. He played college football at the University of North Carolina. He signed with the Washington Redskins as an undrafted free agent in 2011. In his seven-year career, Sean Drawn played for seven different teams and spent a preseason with two different others, which is a total of nine different teams. Outside of his football career, he is also a loving and dedicated husband, a father of two amazing children, a father of a nonprofit. He's an entrepreneur. He's a real estate investor. Please help me welcome Sean to the show. Sean, thank you so much for being here. No problem. Thanks for having me. Oh my gosh, as I'm like introducing you, it's just the list goes on and on and on and on and on. I know, you reminded me of stuff. (laughs) (laughs) You know what, isn't that crazy how life goes? Sometimes I feel like as you're pushing through life, you don't really realize all the things that you do and accomplish. That's right. No, you're right. You're 100% right. I mean, because you you can get tunnel vision on one thing and then, you, you know, Next thing you know, you look up and you added another thing to your toolbox or your, 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 I don't know the word, but stuff just keeps adding on as you go. I want to start off with talking about, um, about that, about the things that have added on over your career, but starting with NFL, what was it like um, for you when you shifted from going from retired, you know, NFL player, knowing that you're going to have to retire what was the mindset like for you during that time period and how did you um make sure or ensure you weren't in a funk and if you were in a funk how did you get out of it that's a tough question um so in transition you mean right yes yeah so that was that that was a tough time for me um i mean having my wife and kids and my parents you know who was have always been my support you know, being there during that time of transition um, made it better. Um, but it was it still was a tough um, transition for me. And I didn't realize how, you know, much it would impact me because, you know, you always you never know. Like with my career, I didn't I didn't know. But I, I mentally tried to prepare for me not, you know, going past shoot, even three years. So I went, you know, seven. So when I got to seven, I'm like, man, maybe I might get to 10. Um, But, you know, in that transition, it was a, it's like somebody dying. Like, you know, I did, I played football since fourth grade. So, you know, not being able to play anymore, something that you, you know, grew up to love and, um, you know, have done all your life, um, majority of your life. And now, you know, that, that thing is gone. It's a, I don't know, separation anxiety, a little, little depressed moments um, and just a, a feeling of like you don't know what's next and you don't know how to fill your time because shoot, even that, you know, your time has been filled with schedules and you be here at this time, you do this at that time and now it's up to you and, you know, what, what else can fuel you like the game is, you know, really a big question and um you know that was that was my thing but the transition was kind of kind of bumpy I mean I had some some moments um here and there but um you know I end up coming out of it um with uh you know with new things that I I like to do so you know just changing roles I mean I can go on and on about it but I hope I answered no I'm glad you you're talking about it I asked you that really because I mean my, my job, I'm, I'm a publicist and mm-hmm. I've watched, you know, I've been in the PR business for sports 13 years and I've watched players, my clients, you know, every, no matter if it's basketball, baseball, football, it mm-hmm. doesn't matter the, the industry. I watch you all go through that uh, right. period. And mm-hmm. it's tough for me on the other end, seeing it, trying to figure out how do I best facilitate? How do I best mm-hmm. assist? How do I best provide the support? And, um, I wanted to start off asking you about that because I feel mm-hmm. like it's, you know, so many, um, players go through it. I think probably I, I, I feel personally 
probably every player goes through it, if not every player, yeah, most. Absolutely. And yeah. I think that the world needs to, if you're not an athlete, needs yeah. to understand, you know, for you guys, yeah, your whole life from the time you're a little child, mm-hmm. you know, you've been doing this one sport and right. then it goes away. And, um, you know, that, that transition is, it can be tough. Um, yeah. yeah. Do you find yourself, you know, even now at times, do you, do you miss it or do you still, you know, envision yourself still playing, playing the sport? I tell everybody the thing I miss most was Sundays and being around the team, the guys in the locker room, um, you know, and I still talk to some guys now, but, you know, being in that locker room atmosphere, you know, you, you can't duplicate that. And that's something that you, I, I really miss. And, you know, watching the game, I actually don't even watch a lot of football, believe it or not. Um, I just, and I did, like, initially I did miss it a lot, but now I, I can't say that I miss miss it. I do actually dream about it. I, I've actually had a few dreams the last couple of months. I don't know. It's, it's periodic. I had dreams that um, I'm on, and it's crazy. It was like almost real life. Like I'm on the bubble of whatever team I'm on. And they're like, yeah, we're gonna, we're probably gonna add you to the to the roster. And then I wake up before like they make cuts or before a game. And I've been having dreams. I have dreams about it, but when I wake up, it's not like, man, maybe I should go try to go back and try to play. I don't know why I'm dreaming about it, but that's it, it's actually been a dream uh, a couple of times. Um, but Recently. Yeah. Yeah, last year. I mean, I think in the last year or two has actually been it's periodic that I I have that like random dream. Like I'm I'm getting ready for it's always the same thing. Like I'm in like spring training or like OTAs and I haven't made the team yet, but it's like almost I'm about to it's close to the season or something like that. It that it's the common thing. It's the same dream every time, but maybe with a different team. It's crazy. Mm. That means yeah. something though. I mean, I'm not a dream specialist, but there's, there's yeah. that it, you're, you're having that dream for a reason. So yeah. I hope you don't ignore that. It is there for a reason. Yeah. I mean, I, I have, I haven't really thought deeply about it. I mean, I, I do feel like I'm, I have that dream for a reason, but haven't really, I guess, sat back and really thought about it. Um, and you know, when I have dreams like that, when I, when I think about it, I don't, think it in regards to football. I think it in regards to life or my spiritual walk or just my next steps, if you will. Um, so, I, I mean, I have thought about it, but I haven't thought too deeply of to as to where um, it, it needs to be in place. You, you get what I'm saying? Like, I don't know how that dream correlates to where I need to be in, in my stage of life right now. Oh, but you'll find out. It'll come to you. It will Absolutely. come to you as it's supposed to. And you're going to say, oh, my gosh, that's why. That's why right. that was happening. That's true. That's how that, that's how life works. Now, now and when you, you when that happens, right. you better. I want to know. Come back to me right. and tell me. because I want to. It's a reason why you're having that dream. And I want to know what that dream is for. I believe that. I believe that. I, I'll definitely let you know. Yeah, please do. No. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit. I know that you're um, you. So you. You then you, you retired, you shifted mm-hmm. from NFL to then being entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. What was that mindset like? What was it like for you to then shift from, you know, going into ter- a whole new territory? Um, how did you mentally prepare and how are you doing it and flowing through now? So I, I've, I've talked about this actually the other night with a couple of friends and my wife at dinner just and I've talked to a couple other guys about it. Um, just like when I felt like I was gonna make it in the NFL, even when I was young, I felt like God put it on my heart. I was gonna, I was gonna play in the NFL. Even when I got to college and um, I was playing safety at the time on defense, and I wasn't doing well, I was like, well, I'm, I'm still gonna make it in the NFL. I don't know how, but I'm gonna get there. And that's just something that I felt like God placed on my heart. And then I was sharing the other night that I felt like. I, I didn't know it was entrepreneurship then, but I felt like I, w- I wouldn't really have a traditional job, if that makes sense. Like, I feel the same way I feel about 
football, then God plays in my heart. I feel like this the same way about entrepreneurship and never and not really having a traditional job per se. Um, so I always felt like that that has been there even while I was playing football. Um, so you know, with that, I actually got introduced to real estate. Um, I mean, kind of in college, but I didn't really, of course, do anything within college. But um, in 2013, I, I was with the Ravens and I ended up getting injured pretty. It was bad. It was like a high in the spring, but I ended up being out for like seven, eight months or so without a call. I had a workout. Well, I was with the Colts for a month. And then I had a workout. And then I didn't get picked back up until the next year. And during that time, while I was out, I thought that was, you know, pretty much it. So I really started trying to prepare mentally and, you know, try to figure out what I wanted to do after football. And I knew, you know, then I did kind of figure I wanted to be in real estate. Um, and I got introduced by this guy named Jamel. He was actually my barber in college, but he was transitioning to be a real estate agent. So he ended up you know, kind of introduced me to the concept of flipping, the concept of rentals um, and all that. So, you know, that kind of sparked me. And, I, you know, while I was playing, you know, I, I listened to a lot of podcasts. I did, you know, all types of research, just digging deep, you know, in the real estate thing. So then, you know, I kind of got into it. And that next year while I was out, I got into it and I did my first flip while I was playing and, uh, you know, got a taste of it of what it could be. I didn't really, I, I, all I knew was from the books and research and the stuff that I read on the internet, all these forms and all that, that's all I knew of how to flip a house. And, you know, that's what I used to go do it. I mean, you know, you get the information and you could have sat on the sideline and not used the information. I didn't know hundred percent what I was doing. I just knew I wanted to do it. I, w I set out to do it and I did it wasn't as effective, but I did it. And, you know, just sometimes stepping out and doing it, you'll learn, you know, by mistake and, you know, school of hard knocks, trial and error. Um, so, you know, with that, I knew real estate would kind of be what I wanted to do outside of, uh, outside of football. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that was it. So you so you shifted gears into real estate and now you're you're um, you're into real estate with and you're working alongside with your beautiful, gorgeous wife. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're also an investor um, doing this. What have you learned? What's can you kind of give some some tips to um, to the real estate buying process right now? And mm -hmm. um, this is a two part question. The other part is what how has COVID um shifted or changed the real estate industry um so with the buying process right now i've always tried to find like when i first got into it i i, I was in another area it's called fedville we live right outside of raleigh which is um, the triangle raleigh durham carry <clears throat> and a lot of deals here were always like pretty high like inflated with prices because there were developers doing you know teardowns and, and you know build building back the new construction and i wasn't in that phase at that that point um and in fairville my guy jamel who introduced me he actually started sending me some uh foreclosure stuff um and i was getting stuff from there and with my buying process i always try to get off market deals or foreclosures which are deeply discounted properties you know i'm not trying to buy anything that's really that's on the market, but um, that was then like times, times shift. And now, I mean, people have properties that are just putting on the market on the MLS. When I say on the market, I mean like MLS um, that everybody can see as opposed to like a private group of investors. And um, you ever heard of wholesaling? Yes. So, so wholesalers, I try to I get deals from wholesalers as well. Um, just for the point where it's not on MLS, it's, you know, a little less visible to, you know, the regular person and it won't be as much competition. Um, so, you know, initially that was the, like the way I bought. And now it's getting to where, you know, people are putting houses on the MLS now 
and now they're being, you know, bid up crazy because now you're competing with homeowners who now have a shortage of in- inventory now. Now they're, you know, getting flips or houses that need a little work, but they don't mind putting the work in because there's no houses to buy right now. So now you're competing with investors and you're competing with, you know, regular uh, clientele. I mean, re- regular um, customers, retail customers. Um, so it's a little different to buy now, but I still, you know, still get deals from wholesale. Um, and that's actually another part of the business that I kind of want to grow uh, with our stuff is doing wholesale deals. Uh, that way I don't have to, you know, flip everything that I come across. If I come across, you know, a bunch of deals, I can, you know, sell it to another investor. Now that I don't know whether COVID had anything to do with it, but I do think it did. I mean, now you got the interest rates drop. A lot of people are buying now. The inventory is low. So I think COVID has something to do with that. And now that the inventory is low, it's good. It's good on the end, but on the front end, it's, you're having to buy a lot higher than you want to. But in the end, you're getting properties bid over. Like a uh, property we recently sold, um, it sold for $25,000 over asking. And, you know, that that stuff really just started happening maybe in like February or March, where that, I mean, people are coming in and bidding crazy amounts over people offering cash to buy houses it's, it's just and i think that has something to do with covid um and now you know like i was talking to somebody earlier just about people are staying home now not a lot of people are moving for jobs yeah. um now so now people aren't selling their houses so there's a shortage of in- inventory and you know the prices are just uh skyrocketing so it's good for investors right now or sellers uh, so, you know, once we buy, you know, it's kind of kind of tough to buy at the right price. But in the end, you do shoot even minimum work to it. You know, you can put it on the market and it's going to sell like that. Um, I mean, uh, so is it only it, certain markets that's that's selling like that or is it a seller's market anywhere in the United States right now? Right now, it's really like that all over. Wow. I mean, it, it's hot right now and it's been hot in Raleigh, Durham. I mean, even during um COVID last year I mean my, my wife has done very well um I mean just the re- interest rates got low so a lot of people were buying a lot of people refinancing and um but yeah here I mean it's not I know it's how I know in Charlotte I got a couple friends in Charlotte um they say it's the same thing there um I think even in California it's like that so I think it's all over all over the board do you think at some point the market will kind of just tap out or like what, what, what does this look like for, if you're a buyer, what do you do? Should you wait? Right. So we're, we're actually, our plan is to try to move, you know, in the next year or two, um, but you know, have anywhere to move, but we do want to build. Um, and we, I, we were talking about this earlier because my wife actually got a listing in our, in our neighborhood. And somebody already did fifty five thousand dollars over what they're asking, so I'm like, man, we need to put our house on the market like, <laughs> like now. But we we won't have anywhere to buy, you know. We won't have anywhere to go, um, you know, unless we, you know, started building now. You know, it's interesting out of that's things that's happened out of COVID. There's obviously been a lot of unfortunate bad things that have happened in regards to health and so forth for individuals, but there's been some positive things. And this may be a a positive spin of how you look at, look at the real estate market. What you're saying is across the board, across the United States, it's booming. Not anytime soon, because in the builder world, like track builders and developers, they can't build them fast enough. They can't build them actually at all, what I'm not gonna say at, at all, but it's taking like six to nine months to build a house, new construction right now. And it usually takes like pre-COVID is like 90 days. If that 60 days sometimes, if you're you know a pretty heavy um, track builder, but it's taking like six to nine months because a lot of things are um backed up, like resin, like resin and um the stuff they use in PVC pipe, stuff they use in uh, to make windows, um, you know, some most windows are made PVC stuff in um, 
OSB sheathing, which is basically the size of, and the floors of a house. That's on, that's backed up. And now you're going to start seeing um, shortages of uh, air conditioned ducts. Um, so, and then windows, if you order windows today, it'll probably be mm, end of July, 1st of August before you even get them. So that's, that's the thing about, you know, whether it'll pop or not. I don't know if it'll necessarily pop. It's just a matter of the inventory is just low. So people are just bidding to try to get houses. So, you know, I don't think the value of houses will go down. I think the values just continue to increase. They're just increasing faster. because they I mean, they increase every year but it's just increasing at a, a higher rate right now. Basically, if you're a buyer uh, right now, should you just, what, do you tap in right now or do you, should you wait or what's your advice? That's the thing too. Like you don't, it depends because if you're a buyer right now, and I was talking about this earlier as well. If you're a buyer right now, if you bid over, initially it may not, appraise but if one or two more houses near that mile or two whatever in the area um end up selling for around the same thing now the values are what they sold for um but in that you still have to I, in my opinion you have to wait another year or two before you can make money uh, when you sell so if you're going to try to play the long game and wait for appreciation then I mean, being a buyer, and if you have the cash to bid against people who are putting twenty, thirty, fifty thousand dollars worth of due diligence down, you know, on a the property, then for an investor buying right now, in my opinion, isn't really the best thing to do. But for a, a buyer who just wants to buy, I mean, it, I think it's it's okay. I mean, I wouldn't say not to. Before an investor, I don't think you can make a lot of money buying. Dad, have you done a deal that just went sour? Have you ever done a deal that just didn't didn't go well with real estate? When I first got into real estate, and you know, this is when I was trying to do three different types of real estate. I was trying to do buying holds, wholesaling, and flipping. And I didn't know a hundred percent. I mean, I knew how to I knew the concept of buying and holding. So this is what we were trying to do. And there was, uh, I think it was seven duplex, seven duplexes. So it was like 14 units that my good friend and I were trying to buy in um, this Goldsboro, North Carolina. And the numbers worked, like the numbers were, it was a home run pretty much. And then we got into it and we, they had an appraisal done, but we didn't get like official inspections. And so we got into it. We ended up, you know, getting like seller financing initially, but then we're trying to get permanent financing from a bank. And then we try to get the inspections and the inspections just came back like, bro, well, I don't know what we got into, but we, you know, had already put money into it. And then trying to work with the actual seller, he was being difficult. And then, you know, eventually the town actually condemned them because they were that bad. Um, I mean, you had like the people were running over the sewer caps in the front yard. So you got sewage seeping in the yard, holes in the floors and leaks everywhere. You got mold. So anything you can name would probably probably happen on that property. So we had put money into it and basically couldn't get the money out because we couldn't sell it because um, they end up condemning the property. So it was. Uh, yeah, that was that was the deal that you know, kind of put a bad taste in my mouth on that side. But, you know, I know, again, I just, I learned something from it. So not to say that I, you know, won't go back because I definitely want to get into that arena, but I just know how to move forward with, you know, those type of deals. Share some tips with that. How do you, um, when bad things happen with, in business, uh, mm -hmm. for example, you know, what you just mentioned, how mm -hmm. do you stay positive? How do you say, okay, this was a life lesson. This was experience. Yeah. And this was not a bad deal. Let me go the other way and not we circle back to it. Mentally for me, I'm, I'm very like, 
I'm not gonna say risky. My wife would call me risky. She's more conservative. You know, she she wouldn't do some of the things that I do. Um, but when you understand it and you see potential and you know, like, okay, I know this can work if you do X, Y, and Z, um, you know, it's easier to stay positive. Um, and that I think that again, it comes with learning, making mistakes, and you know, really educating yourself on the subject. Um, and I, I just know the power of real estate and I know what I know. So if I go, you know, keep pushing forward, I know the things that I want to happen will happen. So it's easier for me to stay positive in those situations. And also don't do a lot of that this now, but I was using my own money back then. Um, but now again, this is something I picked up along the way. And I knew then, but I didn't want to use other people's money. I, I knew about hard money, private lenders, and, you know, th those type of things. Um, but I wanted to go out and venture out and say I did it with my own money. I wasn't scared. I jumped out and I made money um, by doing so. But then on this, that deal, like we were just talking about, I lost my money. So, you know, it wasn't, it was stressful that I lost the money, but it wasn't anybody else's money. So I, you know, I didn't get a bad reputation for losing somebody else's money. Um, so that was a positive, you know, um, if you want to look at it that way, I did, you know, so that that's, in my opinion, that's how I stay positive. Can you give some advice to someone who may be listening or watching? How do you use someone else's money? Someone who may be saying, hey, I need to save for my down payment. I have to use my own money. And that's the way they've been taught to yeah. um, acquire property and real estate. Can you give advice and give some tips on how you get going and using someone else's money to get in the real estate game? Before, it was hard to get hard money. That's why they call it hard money. And it's and with hard money, it's not a traditional bank. It's like a bunch of uh, basically an investor has a pool of money for, from private investors who are getting a return. So he's deploying their capital to investors to make a return. So say he's getting their money, um, he's paying them 8%. He's going to charge me 11% and make his three. Um, you know, that's just the concept, right? And in order to get that money, I don't know about now because I have an investor which I'm blessed to have who, you know, doesn't look at a bunch of different stuff that he would in a regular investor, but you typically need, of course, a business. You need to have be incorporated somehow um, because with that type of money, they can't lend to, they can't lend personally. It has to be to a business. Um, and somewhat have experienced like one or two deals under your belt. They look at that. Um, and if you don't have the experience, you can partner with someone who does, um, has the experience to, in order to qualify to get the loans from a hard money or a private, um, private investor. Um, and then too, there are people like me and you who don't want to do real estate, that, but they believe in real estate and they, um, they want to lend their money and make a return instead of putting it in the stock market or just a traditional 401k, which they can actually pull from that 401k to lend to you on a deal and you pay them a return. There's plenty of people that's like that. I have a, um, a few people who are actually going to lend on my next deal who are doing that. They're um, borrowing from that 401k. They're giving me the money and then I'm paying them a return. Um, so Again, like with me, it, it came to where I was just, I'm putting it out like kind of social media is word of mouth instead of, and I heard somebody say like, don't ask for money. You show them what you can do and people will come to you wanting to give you the money. Uh, and that's really what happened. And, you know, I have private investors and I have hard money. Um, and this is how I'm not using my own money. Um, to do deals. So do you offer those same investors to other people or do you kind of hold your investors to you? And they're like, it's like your secret. I don't, you know, your, <laughs> that's your, I don't want to say your secret, but yeah, that's your, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's your, uh, yeah, I guess it's your, yeah, it's your, it's your, my little, your my community. Little bag. It's your, yeah. That's yeah. this for you. No, I mean, if they want to lend their money, that's up to them. Like, I, I mean, 
I was sharing what I wouldn't want to give people personally like their information unless yeah. I ran it by them, of course. But yeah, I mean, if they're doing deals with other people as well. So um, I'm not the only one, but the, and this is with the private investors, um, but with the hard money guy, I mean, that they're just like a traditional hard money, like a, not an institution because they're not, but they loan to people. They have uh, a portfolio, I think for like, 14 or 18 million. So they have plenty of money to go around. Um, so with them is with them, the only reason I have two types of investors is because the hard money costs a little more. Um, and then the private investors, you know, you can, you know, get away with paying a little less in interest. Um, but with hard money, and I don't know if you know if you're familiar, but I explain like with hard money, if you get if you get a loan, you have to pay, pay points, which is basically a percentage of the loan, the total loan. Then you have to pay the monthly interest um, of your total loan. Um, and then you have to pay like every time you want to draw for your rehab funds, you have to pay a few hundred dollars for that. So that costs add up. But if it's a deal that has a lot of spread in it, you can go with that because you can afford to lose a little equity um, and, you know, put into the deal. Um, but on a smaller deal, you can use a private investor where you're only paying, you're not paying points, you're not paying a, um, like origination fees and you're not paying uh, draw fees on a rehab. You get all of that money. With, this is how I try to do it. You get all of that money in one lump sum and you only pay interest on that total amount monthly hmm. so that's how i do with my private so that's the difference between a private investor or a private lender as opposed to a hard money lender you can these deals be deal a deal that you actually can it be your actual residence that you live in or does it have to no, be see, investor that's why you have property to, remember i said you got to have a business they can't loan the personal Oh, that's right. You said that. Okay. Yeah. But you can do a, a um, investment property, like a rental property. Mm, okay. So a lot of people are doing, a lot of hard money guys are, are getting over to that side because a lot of um, investors or entrepreneurs, they don't necessarily have those two years of tax returns. Like you have to present to a traditional bank. You pay a little more interest, but once you have it, rent it out for typically it's a seasoning period of six months that the traditional banks want to see so once you rent it out for six months now you can go to the bank and say look i have this um this cash flowing asset that i want to refinance so then you go cash you go refinance at a higher amount then you can pay your hard money investors back and you can take cash out. So, right. so you can use that hard money to get, you know, traditional financing for like a rental property, but you can't use it uh, for personal to answer your question. Got it. That's awesome. That's great information. Do you, are you, do you offer that resource to clients? Is it, what's an advantage of utilizing your business, your services for your real estate? So right now I'm actually not teaching it. Um, I mean, I've been thinking about it because a lot of people have been asking me, like, you know, how to get started. And I get a lot of people, you know, want to do lunch and dinner and talk about it. Um, but what I said was that I may start doing is partnering with, partnering with people who want to get into it. And, you know, I'll kind of walk them through everything that I do on the deal. But we share, I don't know, in the in the profit or whatever. Um, and that way I'm helping them out. I'm not wasting my time because mm -hmm. people say they want to do stuff all day, but when it gets in the thick of stuff, it's kind of like, right. you know, and then you will probably have to end up taking on the job anyway. So right. um, if you're going to be in it, you might as well, you know, get some of the, the equity or the profit that is going to uh, happen. So I haven't gotten that far to where I'm like teaching it, but you know, it's something I'm passionate about and I, I love to talk about it, but, you know, at this point, I haven't gotten to 
teaching it. And I do want to, you know, I, th- I did think about doing like some deals like that with people. I think you should. I think it's, um, if anything, if this is something, if it's, you know, kind of ticking in your brain coming out of this yeah. podcast, right? But I think it could be a great resource for people um, to utilize that. It could be a great service offering. Mm-hmm. Not That's not true. doing it for everybody, but for the right person. I think, you know, right trusting people. your gut. Yeah. Right. And following that gut intuition. And it could be another avenue, another revenue stream for you uh, that you're obviously, you know, vested in and you know what you're doing. Absolutely. Yep. I agree with that. I appreciate that. I know that you recently started a food cook-off challenge with <laughs> other NFL players. How did that start? Um, who's been part of the challenge and who's winning? And, you know, what have you know, the your NFL player friends along with yourself been cooking up? Um, so really, we need to make it an official challenge, right? Okay. So I've always cooked, right? It's, it's kind of one of my other things that I like to do but my wife recently got me a Traeger grill that I've been wanting for years I just didn't want to spend the money on it well first of all it was a smaller grill they didn't they had they didn't even have the big one that I have now so I didn't want to pay that amount of money for a small grill um so if I was going to get one it was going to be worth the money I spent and so we were in Costco the other day and my wife got me a Traeger so now I've been going crazy um, so the other night when I was posting about it, so my guy who was with college teammates, EJ Wilson, he, he's been avid about it. Um, Eric Ebron, uh, Trey Boston, he, I think he was on it. My boy, Kevin Reddick, um, who has a couple other guys that's been just they'll they'll put stuff on the grill and then that tag is like where you at you know <laughs> stuff like that but um uh, the other night i i was just supposed to, i ain't even tagged them I, I don't think on the first one on the second video I, I just tagged them and then eric uh was already i guess he was cooking something much so he added it he uh chimed in and tagged me and then they didn't know i had something else cooking up and then i told him i had to end the challenge i was uh because i was smoking some short ribs and then uh, I ended up having, I was making some oysters too. So I oh, grilled wow. some oysters and I told him I had to shut the, shut the challenge down and kill him with the oysters. <laughs> so who's so who's winning? Who's the judge of this challenge amongst all of you guys? I, I, I'm judging myself. I'm, I'm definitely winning at this point. I, I broke out the oysters the other night. It was, it was a dub automatically. I, I didn't get a response. I didn't get no, uh, any pushback. So I, I tell silence is a is a uh, a deafening yes that I won. So I'm, I'm crowning myself the champ right now until until further notice. Okay, I like the sound of that. So clearly, you have a passion for cooking. What what's the end goal of this? Like, what's the if you could kind of click your heels in a perfect world? Would you would it be a cooking show for you? No, maybe I actually toy with the idea because I um I I go out to eat with Willie Parker and a couple other of my friends um at this at this steakhouse and we you know you just talk about business talk about life and and we always talking about what what each other cook uh Willie he doesn't really post what he cooks on on Instagram but we talk about it you know through text and we kind of kicked around the idea like bro what if we did a cooking show um of us, you know, just some recipes that we like to do. We both do it. Then we, you know, kind of interview people, you know, during our, our cooking segments. So it's, you know, just about the food that we like to eat and then, you know, bringing on other people, kind of like what you're doing and just talking about, talking about life um, and, you know, their interests and what they're doing and, you know, just sharing our passion that we like to cook and, you know, sharing our life, a part of our life you know, with people who may and may not be interested, you know. I so, think that's a great idea. So are you, is that what you're thinking of doing? It's so much that goes on my brain. I'm like, yeah, I, I mean, that's, yeah, that's one of the things I actually want to do, but um, haven't really got far out there with that yet. It's kind of just, you know, we're still talking about it, talking about it, but, uh, and we, we, we actually reached out Willie's, not his manager, but one of his good friends who 
you know, kind of take care of some business and stuff. Reached out to a guy about doing like a little mini series. Um, but the cost to do it was just like astronomical. So we were like, man, we can just do it, get a nice, we got cameras and stuff, but just be the right person to kind of help us out and, and do a little mini series, get some interest and then, you know, kind of go from there. You know, speaking of your brain, you said you have your brain, you know, you go through your brain ticks. What, mm -hmm. what makes your brain tick? Uh, what, what is your mindset like? What are you passionate about? I'm very passionate about my family. I'm very passionate about being the leader of my house, uh, leading them spiritually, um, just emotionally, and, you know, just being that husband and father that, you know, who will definitely, like, even what they're going through out their day, like, not not like I'm Jesus or anything, but like, what would dad do? Or what did dad say? What type of advice did he give me? What type of advice did my husband give me? Or, um, I, you know, try to set the example, you know, try to be the the right example for my kids, you know, cause I, I had a great example in my father and my mom. Um, so, you know, I try to, I want to keep that going and I want to be that person for my kids and my, and my wife. Um, and, those closest around me. I'm constantly thinking about like, did I, was I present today? Was I, did I play enough with my kids? I know they, you know, they had that time. They like to watch TV and do whatever, but I make sure that, it, you know, I do something with them. They love to fight. They, they want daddy to fight them all right, every other night. Yeah. That's their thing. And, you know, I try to make sure that I'm doing something you know, to that effect and, you know, just spending time with my wife who I love and adore and want to be around all the time and make sure that I'm, you know, doing devotion or just spending some time with her. And, you know, we don't get to do devotion every night religiously, but, you know, I try to make a point to make sure that I get that time in with her um, as well. So that's like every day, that's like my, concern or worry to make sure that I put that time in, that, that right time in with my, my family um, on that side. And, uh, you know, just being outside of that, just being financially free, being a good friend, having fun in life and doing the things I like to do. I just love that answer. That was so beautiful. Um, it's amazing to hear how much you love your family, adore your, your wife and your children. It, it leads me to ask you something I just thought of as you were talking. Um, mm -hmm. During COVID, I, 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 you know, as I've been doing this show and talking to people, and I know that we're shifting out of COVID at this point and states are opening up and so forth. But I've talked to some people who, um, you know, their relationship has gotten better during COVID, mm -hmm. some that it, 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 it did not flow so well during COVID, some who've had right. to learn how to readjust and learn patterns differently, you know, obviously under right. different situations. What was that like for you and your family, um, you and your wife, especially because you guys also work together too. Um, was, was it a challenge? Was it a breeze or, you know, what, what was that like? What was the quarantine conditions like for you guys, if you don't mind sharing? I mean, we, we have been around each other like all the time since I can remember. So it's, it really wasn't anything new other than we had to make sure that the kids were doing their work during quarantine. So that was really the biggest challenge, like us spending time together, like who wouldn't wanna, you know, spend time with each other and the kids and, and you know, us or whatever. But the biggest challenge was the kids and, you know, trying to make sure they kept up with my school, their school. My son, he's just, <laughs> he's all over the place he's six so you know having him he was in kindergarten at the time having him you know just stay on track was the biggest thing but then we end up we knew like both of us was busy like we work together but we don't I mean Shonda she has you know clients you know outside of what we do um but then I'm doing you know flips and stuff and staying busy there so we were gone all the time so we couldn't really be at home with the kids so we had to end up putting them in a uh, private school so that they can go back to school um during the pandemic uh, which actually turned out to be a blessing because they they're learning 
crazy stuff. I, I can't even, I can barely help my daughter with her homework. <laughs> this type of yeah. stuff they're doing. And uh, they come home talking about all the stuff they learned. And, you know, so it, it wasn't, you know, us being around each other, it, it's always been like that. So you know, it wasn't anything new other than the school portion. You know, you guys seem to just fit so well, uh, you and your wife. What do you attribute that to? What kind of advice can you give to someone else? How do you find, how do you find your love? How did you realize she was the one? It's, it's an easy answer for me because it's been the same since the first person asked me. Like we, and we initially, we met like over Facebook, like in 2006, when they first started allowing, I guess you had to have a college email in order to get on Facebook. So yeah. we had we had this thing called CTOPS, which is basically freshman orientation. And as soon as they gave us our college email, we started adding everybody that we could find that was going to UNC. So we initially met there, but um, we, and we didn't meet at orientation. We met at a party freshman year, like during the, okay. I don't know, it was early, during the fall or the summer, but we ended up meeting, but we didn't start dating because she had a boyfriend, I had a girlfriend, and we always, uh, like, towards the end of our college groups, we would get with each other and pretty much talk about our relationship. And uh, then I end up, um, we end up talking, um, and then we end up just hitting it off. We realized we liked each other uh, more than what we thought we would have. Um, and then from there, I mean, I tell everybody the same. I knew she was the one because I never – ever got tired of being around her at all. Like the first time I could ever say that <laughs> about anybody. Um, I never, and to this day, I don't get tired of being around her. And I think we, um, I think we're figuring out kind of why we, we're we like that. And like early on, we not really like super talkative. Oh, she's coming in here. Um, no, Is like, she gonna join us or no? She's just walking in. I think she was working. She just coming to get. Oh, break. we were just talking about you. Hi. I was just asking about your your beautiful relationship. If you should, if you can hear your husband, if you were a fly on the wall, and you could hear how beautiful he talks about you and your children and your family and being the leader of your household, sister to sister, honey. I appreciate it's it. beautiful. Yes, I got I got a good one. <laughs> yes. And I was just asking him before you walked in, I said, when did you know, how did he know you were the one? And he was just answering that. Um, I don't know if you heard him, but if you did, it was, it was beautiful. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, I, it's the same. We had, we definitely, we've got a lot of similarities um, and we have definitely differences. some differences too, but He's always just kind of been, I mean, for real, like my best friend. And I think that, you know, he feels the same way about, about me. And um, we do, we spend a lot of time together and it's never really an issue. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now that you've just joined a minute, can you give some advice to the viewers and listeners who are out there who may, you know, married, who, who are married? What's the key to longevity? I mean, you two are happy. You just, you enjoy being in each other's company. You have been together for a long time. What's the key to that? What, what would you say that is? Well, I, I would say to kind of not backtrack, but somebody's, else's reason for them knowing that their their wife or spouse uh was the one doesn't have to be the same reason that you uh you know say this is the person that i want to be with it what i don't know i can't tell you like what to feel but i think you just know and that was my reason and to this day still is my reason other than you know she's a great person i mean she like I said, we butted heads, but we also are kind of similar. Uh, so we kind of balance each other out. Um, but the key to longevity, I would say, is just, you know, keep spending time. Uh, make sure that your time with your spouse is priority. Um, and, you know, also give each other space. And also learn how to communicate. Because she's a, she's a planner. And I'm kind of a, I told you, I'm, I'm like the risky mindset type of guy. So I kind of go yeah. 
you know, as I, I don't really talk a lot about what I want to do. I just do it. And that got on her nerves. Like when we first started talking. So initially I was like, man, I got to tell you like my, I don't have a plan. So what, what am I going to tell you? But now that I know she is like that, I have to adjust and adjust to what she likes and not just brush it off. Like, look, you just crazy. I ain't, I ain't doing all that. So just so being able to adjust and sacrifice, you know, your own comfort for your wife or husband. And I think like kind of to follow up on that is that I needed to learn. And, you know, I think Sean, the same way, we needed to really understand that we're on the same team, right? So when he does something that I don't like or I don't agree with or that irritates me, <laughs> um, I have to realize that he's not doing that to hurt me or to get on my nerves or, you know, whatever. And I think that e even like little things, like we talk about, I don't know, closing the cabinet, closing doors. the cabinets or, you know, leaving trash, some, you know, anything. Um, but I, I need to realize, or I needed to realize, and I do, I think much better at that now is just that like, he's not doing that to bother me. Right. And I think that a lot of relationships, you just feel like the other person is doing something just to get on your nerves. Um, and a lot of, I feel like a lot of my friends' relationships have ended or, you know, been not so great relationships because they feel like somebody is doing something intentionally to, to, to bother them or, you know, regardless of what they're saying, um, they do it anyway. And so, you know, I just think that that would be the yeah. key. For and when you don't talk about it, you're going to feel that way. Like if we never talked about the fact that hey, I'm not doing it to get on your nerves, it's just something I'm not even thinking about. I'm going to get salt and pepper and I just don't close the cabinet. So this, you know, I'm not saying I'm leave this open. I know this is going to hurt something. Yes, it you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> but how, how long did it take? Did you guys go through therapy or did someone an outside? Was it like, how did you know, how did you get there or, or did it, did, this just come naturally or how, you know, how did this come about? I had to, Say it again. In you the did. name of okay. Jesus, I had to lay hands on him. No, he didn't. We've never, we've never done therapy. Um, you know, I, I think that again, I'm a, a big, like, let's have an adult conversation. Let's talk mm -hmm. about something. Um, well, I'm like that when he gets on my nerves, but when I get on his nerves, <laughs> it's not, it's not, I'm not as vocal. Um, but I think that, you know, we've been married seven years um, and we've had a lot of, you know, at the beginning we didn't communicate very well and um, we've had a lot of like tougher conversations or just like real, hey, I need to have, I need you to understand what I'm thinking and what I'm feeling and, you know, uh, what's bothering me. And we've had to learn how to, you know, not be defensive about somebody else's feelings and just really sit down and understand. Um, I still, you know, I'm, I'm not against therapy. I think that, you know, or counseling, I think that it's a, a good idea, um, especially before you get married, just to have these conversations that, you know, I feel like we learned or we had to have a couple of years into it. Um, but, but I think real life situations are really the real therapy. You just have to be willing to address this situation when it comes about. Because in therapy, you can say, well, when this happens, I'm not going to do that. Oh, I'm going to do this. You don't know what you're going to do when the bullets start flying. Yeah. So right. real life is really the teacher. And being able to talk through those real life moments is really what, what makes you um, either flourish or, you know. How do you dive deep? How do you individually, how do you guys dive deep, you know, internally to stay grounded? Uh, how do you give to yourselves individually so that you're able to give to your, to each other collectively and to your children? Um, <laughs> how, how, how have you guys learned to do that? She knows like, I'm, I'm kind of my dad. Um, and he loves like some me time. Ain't nothing like me time to him, but I like spending time but I also like my me time. And I think, you know, early on, and I didn't mention it, but when I first stopped playing, like I was going through these moves, like I just wanted to be alone. I didn't know that, but I just wanted to be alone, me and 
me and my guitar. That was my therapy. Mm-hmm. Playing the guitar, that was my therapy. But I didn't realize it until one morning we had got into it. I didn't realize it until one morning I was playing the guitar. This is maybe before church or something. And Shonda came in the room where I was and was like, are you going to, what do you say? Are you going to help clean up or are you going to help with the kids or something like that? And I lost it. I was like, Look, I don't do nothing right here. All I want to do is play. I'll just play on my guitar. And, or I just, what did I say? I, I just stormed out the room past her. It was like, whatever she wanted me to do, I started doing. And I didn't realize like some stuff was building up. Right. And, and that was just the moment. It wasn't even about <laughs> her. It was, yeah. It, yeah. And yeah, and what she, she was messing saying. with me in my me time and my yeah. therapy right now. And yeah. I didn't realize that until after the fact, but we talked about that. Um, but I think, like you said, uh, those are the things that, I mean, I have with golf and guitar and really those are my only like top two things that I like look when I'm want to when I want to do that I want to do that like it's not a bunch of times that I'm doing it so when I do it I want that to be my time your time um as I think just giving yourself that time and realizing what your therapy is and having that kind of keeps you grounded and keeps you want to feed into your wife and your kids and again like like I said earlier this is my my thing is I want to be able to feed into my wife I want to be able to pour into my kids and that's that's priority as well um but you know like I said there's you know you got to learn your your things yeah I mean I think that I think we do a pretty good job of like giving each other time like I have a good group of girlfriends and Sean you know whether they're here or um we go to dinner or you know Mm -hmm. whatever it is um that's kind of just like my time I do work quite (laughs) quite a bit um so I get a lot of alone time or time that's away from the kids and Sean and and that sort of thing um but and to be honest with you like I'd like to spend most of my free time with Sean, um, oh, you know, you guys are so sweet. <laughs> you both said the oh, same thing. He said that about you too. And you weren't even in the room. Oh. He said, that's so beautiful. Um, Go ahead. I'm we, sorry to interrupt. No, that's I think okay. that's so beautiful. Okay. So we do a lot of like traveling. We make it, you know, we, we are intentional about dating and our trips and, um, you know, just really kind of enjoying each other on vacation or whatever it is. So, um, you know, we, we, we do get our, our time apart or our time, you know, away, but ultimately I think that we really feed off of each, each other. other. And even if we're not like, we can sit, we talk about this, like we can sit in a car from here to DC where my sister lives for four hours and not say a word and still just really enjoy the fact that we're together. Mm-hmm. Um, I know it sounds so cool. That's so beautiful. <laughs> you know what? Because what it sounds like to me is you guys really, you, what it, the basis of everything is your love, but, uh, but honestly, your friendship, you yeah. guys really love each other. You love the being of each other. You yeah. love the friendship of each other. And I think if, if you, when you have that at the core, it doesn't matter what happens in the world because yeah. you love that person right. no matter what. Right. That's beautiful. And- and believe it or not, that was actually something that we thought not, was going to be a problem. Because problem. we, mm. like you said, we rode, this was in college though, we rode all the way to the sister's house. We didn't really say a whole lot. I had, <laughs> this is back in the day, I had a, yeah. uh, a DVD player that flipped out <laughs> and we played Martin the whole way. Yeah. We watched Martin the whole way. We didn't really say a whole lot. But then we had it, because I'm like, does she really like me or she she decided she was thinking the same thing like, like why don't we have anything why don't we to, got talk about? to talk about but then we realize like we spend a lot of time together we, we are experiencing the same things as, at the same yeah. time so we're not coming you know we're not coming together and then talking about our days um but now that we do spend some more time you know apart and we're both working and we're both kind of out of the house and mm. the kids are getting older and doing things, you know, we're able to have more conversation and more things to just chat in general about. Um, 
So that's nice, but it's, we still can very much just sit with each other and not have <laughs> much, to much say. to say. Long as long as uh, you touch me. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's so beautiful. I would like to wrap up uh, this segment with um, with what I call tell and tell, which is a play on the word show and tell. What is something that you can tell us about yourselves that the world does not know? Um, it could be maybe your morning routine, maybe something I don't know you guys do as a family. I'm just throwing some things out there. Um, I would need you to tell me, but something you're, you're open to sharing uh, that you would like the world to know now. <laughs> like everybody knows everybody knows like social media lets everybody know everything right what about your I mean, morning routine like do you have a special do you have a morning routine that you do every day that you can share then give give people an idea of what that may be and take them into that world so our goal routine <laughs> <laughs> is to get up in the morning work out Good you know morning. devotion get your day going get the kids ready take them to school and then start your day um and we've actually, we have this challenge going on right now with some of her friends and my friends, um, a 20 day challenge where, you know, we're eating good. We got a good diet, no alcohol, no refined sugar, no bread. Um, read you at least one scripture a day, drink your water. You got to exercise 45 minutes a day and walk at least a mile, walk or jog a mile a day. Um, so that's actually been our routine the last nine days. We're on day nine. We're on yeah. day nine now. Um, so that's our routine. So we did it to try to help build a routine. Also help myself, um, you know, just have some accountability partners uh, to help that routine that we initially had kind of be uh, a natural discipline um, <laughs> from here on out. So, but she's been getting up earlier than I have. She's been getting up at 4.45. And she goes and work out, work out with her friend. Um, we do a 530 workout class. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's hard to get up at 445, but yeah. um, beneficial. And I feel like, you know, I get so much more done. I'm able to, you know, as far as like, I can spend a little bit of time with the kids in the morning, we can take them to school. Everybody's on time. We get to have like, you know, just some conversation and it's not, um, it's, it's, being proactive versus being reactive. reactive. And right. so, you know, we, I get up early, I'm able to get my workout in and I'm not so like rushed. frustrated and rushed yeah. in the morning, you know, when I'm, when we're trying to help the kids get themselves together and then get to school or to camp or whatever it is. So, um, I'm a big, I'm a big proponent, proponent of 5am. <laughs> The, the the early mornings um that would kind of be i guess my yeah my secret to success so working out devotion spending a little time before you get your day going and then you get your day going yeah well that is wonderful i mean it sounds like you guys are just on the right track you have accountability partners you have a friend group going on if someone is interested in joining you on your journey being part of your business wanting to just contact you what is the best way for them to go about doing that uh well i am um the triangles housewife on all social media media platforms um so instagram facebook that's pretty much how you'll get in touch with me um i'm also pretty easy to look up just shonda drone and i am sean underscore drone on instagram and then i have the business page which is highly favored solutions llc on instagram as well that's the business page and i have the business page which is highly favored solutions llc on instagram as well that's the business page follow us on our little little journey well i will be following in your journey your journey's not little it sounds massive to me i've been <laughs> so impressed from your relationship to the real estate component to the cook-off challenge and i'm going to speak into existence your cooking show um right. i think everything is just amazing so thank you both for being on this show and being on this podcast i think you both are amazing your energy is amazing and you know, i really enjoyed this likewise you you actually remind me of uh one of our college classmates Rhea, Rhea oh, Davis. yeah mm -hmm. yeah like just that same like y'all got that big smile and like the way you 
and she's a journalist as well. So she's in that same field. So you guys kind of have a, a similar personality, but great spirit, great questions, great conversation. I appreciate you. Well, thank you. I appreciate you both for being here. Well, that is it for this episode of the Journey Told Podcast. I'm going to leave you with words that my father so often said to me, and that's to be the best version of you that you can be. Until next time, folks, let that sizzle in your spirit. Mm -hmm.